subcommittee will come to order. Uh, we're, we're going to be interrupted by votes here shortly, and uh, so we're trying to make the best of a difficult situation. Uh, I'll just say that, that it has been a continuing interest of this subcommittee uh, on the lessons learned from irregular warfare and how we go forward. And so today's hearing is, is an attempt to get a cross-section of private sector opinion about, uh, about that subject, and we very much appreciate uh, the witnesses being here and in advance your patience in uh, a rather constrained day. Uh, with that, I'll yield to the ranking member, Mr. Langevin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank our witnesses for being here. I thank the chairman for holding this hearing. Um, in uh, interest of time and brevity, uh, in light of the fact that we're going to be calling votes, I'll submit my opening statement for the record. But again, thank our witnesses for being here. And I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, let me turn it over to our witnesses, Mr. Rudy Atala, Chief Executive Officer of White Mountain Research, Mr. Mark Cohen, Vice President, Engineering and Chief Technology Officer for Unisys Federal Systems, Barry Costa, Director of Technology Transfer of the Mater Corporation, and Scott Jacobs, President of New Century U.S. Again, thank you all for being here. Uh, we'll turn it over to you, uh, and without objection, your entire written statement will be made part of the record and we'll turn it to you to uh, summarize your statement, uh, if, if you will. Mr. Atala. Mr. Chairman, honorable members of the subcommittee, thank you uh, for the invitation. Let me just dive right in uh, and outline a few of my thoughts. Um, I'm going to start by uh, discussing a, a few points on the challenges to uh, irregular warfare uh, as, as we see it from, uh, from our side, from my company. Uh, the first challenge is understanding non-Western friends and foes. Perhaps the greatest challenge to IW observed since 9-11 uh, attacks is our inability to accurately understand and therefore project how and why non-state allies and adversaries, including those inspired by militant strands of political Islam, think, organize, and operate. Part of this problem set arises from our institutional tendencies towards mirror imaging, that is, thinking like professional soldiers, analysts, and policymakers rather than than non-Western activists, bureaucrats, or militants motivated by as much, uh, as much by uh, identity, belief, or cultural imperatives as they are by traditional notions and strategy. Challenge number two is our over-reliance on technology. Despite recognition since 9-11 of the importance of sociocultural understanding, the reality of our approach to IW remains focused on zeros and ones. We continue to rely increasingly on intelligence derived from technical sources and less on humans. Context derived from uh, understanding and thinking like others takes a backseat to information. Beyond the monetary burden associated with over-reliance on warfighting technologies, our ability to grasp and contend with complex sociocultural issues is gradually eroded. Our soldiers have grown accustomed to possessing enormous amounts of intelligence data at their finger tips that provide answers to almost every question arising within the operating environments. But whether the financial resources uh, required to sustain this technology will be there in the coming lean years is unknown. Soft units will have to uh, return to more traditional modes of working as small units conducting operations by, with, and through local military liaison forces and other local surrogates. Although advanced technologies will certainly play a role in these cases, these small units will succeed or fail based on their ability to analyze, fight, and navigate within the local environment. The third challenge is defining the political outcomes of IW. It's well-known maxim that war is politics by other means. A clear understanding of our objectives and strategies in waging IW is essential essentially given the primacy of influence and in winning at war's moral level. Further, the clear articulations of these objectives, basically our desired end state to the American public is also key, given this necessity to generate support for the long-term operations and patience that characterize effective irregular warfare. Fourth, our fourth challenge is limited to SME immersions. Uh, another apparent challenge in combating irregular warfare uh, is um, basically having a lack of, of reliable subject matter expertise in some regions of the world. Generating a meaningful understanding of a country or region's sociocultural issues requires years of immersion. It has been our observation that when DOD reacts to a new issue, it often reaches out to academia 
uh, for answers. However, it's often the case that academic advisors have limited understanding of ground truth sociocultural context because their expertise is gleaned from desktop research or coupled with uh, trips to a distant capital. Instead of turning to individuals who have spent meaningful time on the ground conducting field work and developing objective qualitative perspectives on the challenges at hand, DOD too often invests in shallow and often biased expert opinions. The result is poor, often skewed understanding of both the problem set and the environment that is nevertheless translated into IW planning. Recommendations. First, we need to expand our human capabilities. As American warfighters, we will always have the ability to do something, but having good intelligence coupled with solid context allows us to do the right thing. Second, we need to couple an expanded human capability with new methods of sociocultural training and alternative analysis programs that promote viewing the environment through the eyes of non-Westerners. Third, continued private sector partnerships as well as uh, are essential for DOD. Businesses like White Mountain Research that work overseas have a great deal to offer as the market forces us to stay in tune with foreign political and sociocultural issues in order to compete. As we conduct our peer-to-peer -peer research and keep pace with local politics in foreign countries, DOD can gain richly from our experience. Fourth, we must bear in mind that everything has an economic lim limitation. Based on this, at the political level, we should determine what we want our objectives to look like and define and calibrate appropriate IW resources to meet it. Fifth, the lack of continuity in DOD must be addressed. Most soldiers never exceed more than two to three years in an overseas assignment. This does not allow for sustained familiarity with the host country that is so crucial to, in IW. This is why programs like AFPAC Hands must be continued and expanded to other regions of the world. These programs can dovetail well with regional centers of excellence like the Africa Center for Strategic Studies or the George C. Marshall Center. Finally, I'll conclude with that more effective and system, uh, systemic <clears throat> screening procedures should be instituted for academic advisors. These should be vetted for not only their subject matter knowledge, but also their objectivity. When advising on a far-flung place like Mali, Nigeria, extensive on-the-ground experience should also be a prerequisite before there are any uh, people put in position to ed educate the warfighters. We have witnessed too many times the unfortunate consequences of unprepared or biased advisors hired to provide direction to crucial DOD initiatives. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Thornberry, Ranking Member Lundgren. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Good morning, Chairman Thornberry, Ranking Member Langevin, other distinguished members of the subcommittee. I am Mark Cohn, Chief Technology Officer for Unisys and our Federal Systems Division. We thank you for inviting Unisys to participate in this hearing about lessons learned in irregular warfare, challenges in today's operating environments, and how industry can contribute to enhancing our security. Around the world and here at home, Unisys is a leading provider of integrated security solutions, many of which incorporate advanced biometric and identity management technologies. For example, we delivered a national identity system for Angola with multiple biometrics that required mobile enrollment in the villages under austere conditions. It provides counterfeit resistant proof of identity to a widely dispersed population representing a cornerstone of citizenship in this emerging democracy as proof of the right to vote and for access to government services. Recently, we delivered a system for Mexico that provides for storage of 110 million identity records comprising fingerprints, iris scans, and facial images with the capacity to accept 250,000 enrollments daily. To defend the nation and defeat our adversaries engaged in irregular warfare, the Defense Department requires capabilities in counterinsurgency, counterterrorism, foreign internal defense, and stability operations. Success depends on separating enemy combatants from the civilian population and the innocent members of the civilian population. Biometrics can be used to record the identity of enemy combatants to link individuals to events such as IED explosions. So in irregular warfare, a primary U.S. objective is also to create a safe and secure environment for friendly populations and friendly military forces to mitigate disruptions to their daily lives. Providing that safe environment is complex as the enemy is generally well concealed within the population. Another challenge in irregular warfare is being able to distinguish loyal indigenous security forces from disloyal foes who can procure uniforms and equipment that allow them to blend 
with regular forces and conduct surprise attacks on installations or within government buildings. It's important to recognize there are limitations to the biometric systems and methods available to U.S. military forces in theater. Data capture generally requires close physical proximity to a subject who is usually uncooperative and relies on equipment and a system architecture that reportedly fails at times to meet vital needs. Today's tactical collection equipment employs custom-built integrated mobile kits that can be bulky and cumbersome and there are problems with data synchronization. Industry can help by taking advantage of new mobile processing platforms derived from consumer mobile devices, extended with ruggedized biometric sensors, and by implementing interfaces in a unified architecture that streamlines uploads to the authoritative database so that it can return match-no-match -match results to the operators quickly. It's essential that transmitted and stored identity information and biometrics stay coupled because separation of the data undermines the system's speed, accuracy, and ability to detect enemy combatants. The relative cost and performance of biometric systems has improved dramatically in the last 12 years. There is greater reliance on multiple biometrics that can interoperate, interoperate between vendors. There are multiple examples of large-scale systems implemented rapidly at predictable cost because we used a framework of proven components. That enables us to deliver systems that are flexible, scalable, secure, to utilize multiple workflows and biometric modalities without complex custom software coding, and to be extensible through standards compliant open interfaces. There's also been a great expansion in the diversity of use cases for biometrics. For example, in Canada, we implemented a system for the Port of Halifax that uses vascular, that's vein pattern recognition, for access to the port's 5,000 workers. Uh, we did the restricted area identity card that uses fingerprints and iris scans to secure Canada's 28 major airports. In all regions of the world, we see widespread consumer acceptance of biometrics. Uh, there's significant commercial interest in banking and other regulated industries because biometrics can simplify the user experience while increasing security when compared with passwords and PINs. Uh, the Department of Defense today employs a user authentication approach that relies on a common access card and a PIN. And this is highly secure but can be impractical. A commercially available biometrics-driven alternative used today in the banking industry is more convenient, less expensive, and time-consuming to administer, eliminates the problem of transport and lockout during PIN reset, and can address risks that the current CAC and PIN model cannot, such as the imposter threat. So in conclusion, we believe the Department of Defense can expect these international and industry developments are in many cases applicable to the challenges confronted in irregular warfare. And we think they can help improve internal security and stability through U.S. and partner country initiatives. UNICEF looks forward to supporting that progress both here and overseas. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Costa, I think we have time to get your opening comments. Chairman, Mr. Langevin, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me today to speak about irregular warfare challenges. Specifically, in my case, the value of sociocultural situational awareness and the technologies and data that enable such awareness and support rapid and effective decision making. What I will describe is 21st century radar, technology that can provide us with rapid and effective insight into the changing human terrain for irregular warfare, as well as other missions. Just like an airborne camera allows us a view of the physical terrain, and infrared lets us see into the night, there are now technologies that allow us a view of the human terrain to include populations, networks, groups, and behaviors. The nation must adapt its methods and create tools that reflect the realities of national security in the new age of real-time global information flow. And we must understand and engage in the public dialogue created by these new communication media. As demonstrated by the swift changes brought about by the Arab Spring, we must rapidly sense, understand, and if necessary, engage with words and deeds to positively shape the environment. While technology can't replace deep human insight, we believe that empirically derived, scientifically grounded technologies can help us understand the human terrain. The defense community has built the science and technology foundation necessary for studying and understanding sociocultural behavior. Given that this technology foundation allows us insight into the human terrain, we are now better positioned to pursue effective courses of action in the full range of military operations. <clears throat> These new technologies are enablers for irregular warfare allowing us to identify extremist networks, groups, and key influencers. Additionally, these technologies support our analysts and decision makers as they work to mitigate irregular warfare threats. Much remains to be done to evolve and adapt these sense-making capabilities to play a vital role, role in current and future missions. Recent rapid and profound shifts in the geopolitical context 
have brought renewed attention to challenges such as hostile non-state actors who may be pursuing weapons of mass destruction, nation-state instability driven by drug economies and transnational criminal issues, humanitarian and disaster relief, and cyber threats. These technologies can give us a more nuanced insight into global challenges, but this is just the beginning, and continued research is likely to make significant additional progress. However, we must conduct such research with a keen eye toward quick and effective transition to those warfighters, programs, and organizations that need them. While there are many very difficult challenges in this area, some of which will take years to solve, there are technologies and methods available today that can help us find key information within this deluge of data and understand the effectiveness of our words and actions upon those with whom we engage. Experience to date suggests an exciting future in which global information, applied research, and analytics are fully and dynamically integrated. However, DOD and the nation are not yet at that desired end state. To get closer, DOD should maintain the momentum created over the past several years by supporting promising research that will enable the capabilities most relevant to future national security demands. Let me leave you with this thought. If DOD had ended its research investment in traditional radar technologies after just five years, the program would have ended around 1939, leaving us with a rudimentary and tantalizing potential for long-range sensing. Social radar is at that tantalizing stage, and we can see the promise. Drones and satellites alone can't detect violent speech or determine how our adversary's narrative is spreading. We need a global and persistent indications and warning capability. We call that social radar. Thank you. Uh Mr. Jacobs, if you don't mind, I think we'll go ahead and, and take your opening statement now. There's still 356 members who hadn't voted yet. Uh, so if, if it, I think we'll have time to, to do that, and then we'll come back for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Langevin, members of the subcommittee. I thank you for your opportunity to appear before this panel today. And as a retired NCIS special agent and a graduate of the Congressional Fellowship Program, I'm acutely familiar with the leadership that this committee does every day. And it's that leadership is vital to our nation's security. New Century U.S.'s privately held firm that is the American subsidiary of the London-based New Century International. Currently, our firm is executing a contract with U.S. government to provide training that supports the professionalization of the Afghan National Army. While New Century International continues to provide training and mentoring to the Afghan National Police and the Afghan National Army in support of the NATO mission in Afghanistan. In short, our programs and the collective experience of New Century personnel has positioned our firm as both a keen observer of irregular challenges worldwide and as a knowledgeable proponent of irregular solu so solutions. At New Century, we believe a focus on improving the capacity of the Afghan military and security forces and other host nation security forces is a wise, cost-effective, and intelligent in investment for supporting American foreign policy objectives because it offers the potential to build an effective leave-behind and self-sustaining indigenous security force after a large-scale U.S. military presence is reduced or becomes unavailable. With that in mind, our firm's flagship program is called Legacy and was first implemented in Western Iraq province, province of Al Ambar in 2008 and is currently being executed in Afghanistan, aimed at improving the capability and capacity of the ANP and ANA forces, the current iteration of Legacy employs a specific doctrine and teaching methodology that is based on the, on the experience of the British Constabulary Force, or Special Branch, in Northern Ireland during the conflict of the 70s and 80s. The value added of New Century Pros lies in the methodology, but also of the deep experience found within the ranks of the personnel that work for New Century. Uh, these are former Royal Ulster Constabulary police officers that have worked tirelessly in Northern Ireland to defeat and disrupt the networks that perpetrated the violence in Northern Ireland. Since irregular threats abroad and federal budget pressures at home are almost certain to continue, we believe the indirect 
and irregular approach will become increasingly important in the days ahead. That is why our firm embraces and supports the all-important by, with, and through creed of the Special Operation Force community as it applies to achieving U.S. foreign policy objectives. We view this indirect approach as practical and essential for working with foreign allies as well as for identifying and confronting irregular challenges around the globe, especially in environments requiring a limited counterinsurgency response, or as Admiral McRaven say, a small footprint. Therefore, establishing carefully targeted assistant programs to develop and empower the local authorities of American allies would be wise. Just imagine America's strategic position if we were able to establish indigenous-led counterterrorism coin programs in states that struggle to defeat irregular networks. Imagine, too, the improved security posture and greater moral authority of America if both the State Department and the Department of Defense would combine efforts and jointly offer assessments to potential partners and allies. Three lessons learned that I would like to talk today that we have learned in Afghanistan. One, special branch-like activities to ultimately succeed need the U.S. military. The U.S. military must provide daily support to overall coin doctrine and strategy. They may, must train for it. They must develop doctrine for it. Uh, and this must be embedded in the very mindset of how we wage war. Effective coin efforts take time. We learned in Northern Ireland that it took over 20 years to penetrate the criminal networks that promoted the violence in Northern Ireland. It takes time. And final observation is, is actually a concern and pertains to the point just made about doctrine, training, and budgeting. Despite significant gains in the field, notwithstanding the 2008 issuance of D DOD Director 3000.07, the department and each of the military service services have remained somewhat listless with respect to this important subject. The 2008 directive assigned additional duties to SOLIC, the Special Operations Low Intensity Conflict Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for organizing lead roles, defining and guiding and coordinating irregular warfare-related activities across DOD. Yet five years later, we still do not see any tangible leadership on these issues anywhere in the department. The 2010 Quadrennial Defense Review and the 2012 Defense Strategic Guidance only lightly reference the concept, and no true champion, no true champion has emerged for institutionalizing such lessons or for providing a sustainable budget. And I must point out, I know I'm just about out of time, but this is very quick, uh, very critical point. General Stan McChrystal recently talked about it takes a network to defeat a network, going back to earlier com comments of Mr. Attila as well. And ironically, this committee echoed uh, his comments uh, back in the 2011 and 2012 National Defense Authorization Acts. An important point where you praise the approach of legacy program in the committee report and um, also the report noted special interest in the attack of the a network approach. And you made two recommendations. Actually, you, you directed the secretary to provide you with two two things, the applicability of legacy program in other operations and regions where network-based threats are present or where conditions are conducive to supporting these threats. And number two, very important point, options for an appropriate management structure within the department to institutionalize and sustain the capabilities that legacy, and I must emphasize, similar programs provide to the warfighter. And finally, in conclusion, we, we agree with both General McChrystal's assessment and your wise words after toiling years in the field doing this kind of capacity building. But we need a more visionary and effective leadership in the United States government, just as more international partners and allies are required. 
Our nation cannot do it alone, simply cannot. By, with, and through is an effective guiding principle for the United States in the years ahead. Our recommendation is for us to follow it. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you all. Lots of interesting uh, topics to follow up on. Uh, we'll stand in recess while we vote, and they're estimating it'll be about 45 minutes. So Pete will buy you all a cup of coffee in, in the back. Thanks, Pete. of interesting points. Um, Mr. Mr. Atola, you said in your testimony, or one of the points you made is there's an over-reliance on, on technology. Um, and yet, uh, we talk about human terrain radar, which uh, I, I, I'm not exactly sure what that is, but, but I presume there's a technological component of that uh, the kinds of things we hear about are monitoring social media, for example, and detecting trends and, 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 and that sort of thing. So I, I guess I would appreciate uh, thoughts from each of you about this, I guess, question. Are, are we too dependent on, on technology or are we and, – and, 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 and are we looking to technology to solve what may be non-technological problems? Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for your for your question. <clears throat> I, I had to think long and hard uh, about uh, about this. And yes, we do rely heavily on technology, and, and, and I find it more with our, our, our younger generation that's actually uh, entering the forces. Uh, they 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 can't function without their devices. Uh, I'll, I'm, I'm an Africanist. Uh, I spend a lot of time on the continent, and and uh, although. Uh, cell phone technology, for example, on the continent is growing pretty quickly. There are remote areas in Mali, Niger, different places where various ethnic groups are, are not relying, they, they don't use technology. So how do we metric those individuals? How do we figure out what those individuals are doing? So when we come back to, we're looking for solutions in, in, um, uh, on Facebook or Twitter just to see what these individuals are doing, and we miss, we miss the, the, the important part. I think well, what we need to do is focus more on the basics. Uh, humans, I, I pushed for that. Sociocultural training is important. We do a little bit of it, but we don't get into uh, uh, the, the depth that is required in order to understand. If I understand a culture, I was born and raised in, in, in Lebanon. When I understand a culture from its roots and I speak the language, the, the last thing I want to do is go to technology to look for an answer. The first thing I want to do is go to a human being that I know 
down the street that may have the answer. And that's where, that's where we're starting to miss the boat. We find ourselves today just sitting seven, 8,000 miles away looking for an answer that's in front of us on a screen instead of having that granular uh, human side that's important. Sir, I, I agree that deep human insight is requ required, and I agree that people like um, Mr. Atola can't be replaced. But on the other hand, there are technologies that allow insight to him, to people like him, and to others, decision makers included, that can allow us to understand trends. Um, 4.8 billion people have a cell phone right now, and most of the world will have a cell phone and be wired, wired, so to speak within the next decade. It's a lot of information that people are generating, that they're discussing on social media and in other forums, and that dialogue becomes increasingly important. It's not the only source. There's lots of other great data sources. There's lots of other great technologies and, and methods. Um, but I would suggest that understanding this emerging dialogue and using these technologies to help foster understanding is critical. And there's been some great examples of successes doing that. But again, it doesn't supplant this deep human understanding that people like Mr. Toa can provide. When you talk about human terrain radar, what sorts of things are you talking about? A variety of technologies. Sentiment analysis is one of them. Emotion analysis is, analysis is another one. Um, technologies that model decision making, others technologies that even forecast instability. There's a system in use in the Department of Defense right now that forecasts long-term instability. So as an example, um, it will government X, um, will country X experience instability events in the next six months? There's a system that does that right now, and it's not perfect. However, it provides deep insight to analysts studying that country and allows them to dig deeper into uh, to issues of interest. So those are the sorts of technologies that I'm referring to. Mr. Cohen, if, if y'all are putting in uh, these ID cards in a variety of, of countries where that don't have maybe as much technology as we do, what are some of the challenges that, that you have run into to Im in implementing those technologies? <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's a, it's an interesting subject that fascinates us in the industry. I could probably spend an hour talking about that. I'd like to keep it brief, though. Um, there are a number of socio-cultural issues that we encounter that are quite striking. In Malaysia, where we happen to uh, do the national ID, um, in that country, they have religion appear on the face of their ID card, which seemed like a pretty oddball concept to, to those of us. They happen to also have a default state religion that goes on there if you don't claim one. It's a different world. In the Middle East, where we do a lot of work, and Malaysia is one of the countries where this arises also, there are cultural concerns regarding how we enroll biometrics because of personal privacy. If you have a fingerprint sensor and you use both hands, there's a tremendous aversion regarding hygiene. Uh, therefore, IRIS is used, say, for the XPLE database in the United Arab Emirates because you can still take a sample with a veil. Mm. Um, so, so we see a lot of variation, and, and in, in candor, um, without getting down in the weeds regarding this sort of cottage industry of biometrics. Um, the way we see it, 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 it is very, has to be tuned to the country and its culture. Um, but the Prime Minister of Malaysia said in 1995, this will be a way that we catapult our country into the 21st century. They saw it as a big part of modernizing their economy, that they could have more participation because biometric verification would then be an, a, a, an inexpensive, widespread um, social good. Um, when Pay by Touch, a U.S. company, I think the U.S. company, uh, went uh, in, into uh, bankruptcy, um, Singapore banks could no longer use fingerprint verification for banking. Malaysian banks that used the thumbprint on their MyCAD, their national ID card, could continue to do banking security with, bi with biometrics. The banks there have a, in a key to unlock the card, and you can put your equivalent of an ATM card onto the same card the government issues and they have a local e-purse application, so you don't have to carry cash when you go to their equivalent of a 7-Eleven. So in other words, this allows people to participate in a modern economy in a way that we don't even think of in this country. Um, and, and, and I could go on about some of the Latin American differences as well, whenever you'd like. Uh, Mr. Jacobs, can you reflect on, on 
on technology and how it has applied and the challenges, I guess. It, you talked about training the Afghan National Army. I would presume in Afghanistan you've run into some of those as well. Absolutely. I, I would first like to go back to the question you asked Mr. Atala here. Um, the purpose of the legacy program is to penetrate a network, uh, the criminal ne network, drug network, terrorist network. And then through that penetration, how you do that is by developing sources, informants, and tasking informants to get information. And then based upon that information, you do something with it. You take action against that net network to disrupt it. And a person can do that. You can ask a person for information. You can task them to do something. It's hard to task a technical device. And even though technical devices are added benefits and can certainly help us in our endeavors, it's the human piece that, in, in my years of experience, have really been de-emphasized in terms of our you know, national strategy. It is more of a reliance on on the technical piece and the very human piece, the human interaction, the relationship development piece is what I believe has been shortchanged um, in, in, in uh, the most recent history. And, um, uh, but but it's, it's that human piece that allows us to penetrate the networks that do these bad things that harm our country. So the challenge, and it is a challenge, is how do you take the good technology and apply it to the human piece? And um, that, that, that is a challenge. In terms of Afghanistan, I, I had just recently come back from Afghanistan and um, I was talking to an Afghan army general about geoint capability, uh, geospatial intelligence, and uh, what were their requirements for this capability. And he was a very practical general. He had fought the Russians um, uh, during the Russian uh, incursion into that, their country. And he said, Scott, what I need is a good map. You know, I don't need the geoint capability. You know, I need a good map. And then I need your help in training the map readers. And again, he focuses on the human piece. You know, an individual utilizing a map and from that map, you do your targeting, you do your operational planning. Um, and I thought that was very insightful from an Afghan general that has the ability to get GeoInt, but he says, no, I can't sustain it. I can't, I, I, there's not a legacy here. I, my people don't understand how to work GeoInt because of my educational, my lack of education here. So you have to build systems at a level in which the, the host country can apply it. And that's a lesson that we have learned through legacy and through other experiences that I've had in my career. Switching topics, in, in your written and in your oral testimony, you talked about uh, the importance of DOD and state and intelligence community working together, that interagency cooperation. Um, can you offer your thoughts on where we are and, and, and um, if you have a suggestion on how that, what can be done to improve that moving ahead? And, and actually for any of you who would uh, offer your insights based on your experience about how well the federal government works with itself and how well the federal government takes advantage of the opportunities the private sector offers. Thank you for the question, Mr. Chairman. Um, the State Department and the Department of Defense have enormous resources, personal resources, training capabilities. Um, but um, oftentimes, um, there is, the, because of the lack of, of coordination between the different parts of the government, um, and, and oftentimes the same purpose, um, we see um, an ability not to fully leverage those resources that both state and both um, DOD have. Um, in many countries, 
that I have been in, you don't have an effective police force. And your military force uh, is that police force. And so you have to use irregular techniques to train a military component. But the problem with the military is that the US military is not a police capability. That resides in the State Department. And so that is where this cross-pollination could really be an effective tool to more accurately and appropriately teach police skill sets to the mili military component on the ground. Um, so, so that's really what I mean about blending in certain environments that we find ourselves in today, where that leverage would be a powerful U.S. You know, strategy to, to work together to get more done on the ground. Chairman, within my domain, we have found that um, technology itself can be a point of agreement. And we've used um, one of the systems that was developed by the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering called the uh, Integrated Crisis Early Warning System as a rallying mechanism to bring both the IC and the State Department together, in, in a limited sense at least, um, around some technology that actually does help them forecast um, and understand data. That in itself has created a, a dialogue, which, which is very, very productive. Um, and in addition, using this um, allows them to more fully leverage private industry since um, this, some of this technology is commercialized and they're bringing this to bear. Um, so MITRE, uh, as a nonprofit FFRDC, is helping support this and um, bringing the world to bear in support of these problems. And, and technology is one way that we believe we can bring it together, and we are. Uh, sir, we've seen um, actually what I would characterize as excellent cooperation in the areas that we get to observe. And, and, and perhaps I should explain that coming at this from the perspective of this identity management challenge, our biggest concern is how do we collect information about the largest group of the population in a cooperative way because it's a lot cheaper and easier to get them to cooperate. So we want a national government or equivalent to create some kind of a use case where the citizens voluntarily benefit from participating. It allows us to kind of deal with the needles and haystack problem. Those that comply, it's cheaper for us to have that data collected by a friendly government so with whatever sensitivity they need to the local culture. And the State Department, the community, and the Defense Department all see the benefit of this and the programs that we have, I believe, are cooperative in this space. Ultimately, there's a shared interest with the ally abroad um, to share information that can be useful, deny movement to adversaries, be able to, to some degree even target the enemy. And it benefits us if we don't have to do the work ourselves using a Western perspective with our local footprint, but rather have them, in a sense, helping us, but by, by dealing with a lot of the uh, data collection and even the analysis in many cases. But if, if I can return just to the general issue, to, to the, the, you know, in terms of technology versus human, I don't think that's really a choice we must make. I think that we have no we have no, we will all be living in a world where technology continues to uh, fl flourish around us. If we fail to take advantage of mobile computing, uh, of analytics that are available to both our adversaries and us, to cloud-based repositories that assemble more and more information together, then shame on us for failing to do that. On the other hand, that's not a substitute for people on the ground. And I, and I don't think it's really a choice that we make directly. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> yeah, I, I, with respect to everybody, I'm, I'm not denying that technology doesn't have its uses, obviously, and, and uh, I think everybody's said that. And in terms of your question on interagency cooperation, I think from my experience, interagency cooperation is very good whenever we're focusing on something kinetic. We tend to come together and, and make solid decisions. I think where, where, where the interagency still lacks is when it's non-kinetic. Uh, decisions are often uh, mired in, in disagreements and um, the approach between the various uh, organizations sometimes slows to a halt and therefore uh, it takes a long time to come up with a decision on a particular problem set. And I think if we can take uh, best practices from how we come together in coordinating on a kinetic strike and apply them to non-kinetic 
uh, issues, I think that that's where we can see ourselves moving forward. Um, I, I find us, again, from, a, from an African perspective across the continent, I, I, I've seen this time and time again from my days in OSD, and now uh, as an outsider working on the corporate side, trying to support sometimes certain agencies in looking at uh, some of the key issues focused on CT. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, I want to thank our panel witnesses for being here today and for your testimony. Uh, before I give my questions, I, I don't know if he had been acknowledged already, but uh, I know this, this subcommittee has had ex its ex jurisdiction expanded and adjusted over the last several years, but uh, uh, in another incarnation, the former chairman of this uh, subcommittee, Mr. Saxon, is in the audience. Jim Saxon just wanted to welcome you, Mr. Chairman. Great to have you here. Um, with that, if I could just turn to our uh, uh, to our witnesses. Uh, I may start with Mr. Cohen, but if others would like to, uh, to chime in as well. Um, you touched upon this in your testimony, but uh, what, uh, again, if you could speak uh, more broadly about the, the capabilities uh, that biometrics and defense forensics bring to an irregular warfare environment, and how useful are those capabilities in a more uh, conventional fight? Th thank you. Uh, I appreciate the question. and we. Um, we focus a lot of attention on, on identification technology with respect to live samples that we get from people that we encounter in real life. That tends to be the economic uh, engine that drives us forward. Um, DNA indexing happens to be one of the biometrics that isn't normally used that way because if you don't get a rapid response. Uh, today it's not available in real time. But uh, DNA is a biometric. We, we have, in my company, done the uh, um, uh, algorithm development work and uh, rehosting for CODIS for the FBI. And so we have some experience with that. We've designed uh, some of the kinship analysis protocols. And that can play a big role um, when trying to sort out friend from foe, even when you don't have a sample from an individual. If tribal affiliation is a factor in someone's loyalty, that is one of the things that you can, in fact, tell from DNA. Um, you also can uh, um, uh, do disaster victim identification, identifying remains based upon relatives using kinship analysis. So, so biometrics has broader set of use cases than just verification of, of identity for willing subjects. Um, but ultimately, uh, um, um, most of the use cases that we think about commercially involve witting subjects who are cooperative. In warfare, we're going to be in the opposite scenario for the most part. And there have been emerging technologies like three-dimensional face verification, which we can use at a distance exceeding 20 meters now to be able to identify with great accuracy and the biometric precision almost at the level of iris recognition, which means that we're dealing with uh, accuracy at the level of tens of millions in, in terms of our discrimination ability. So we, we could have standoff distances, protect facilities that way. We also have uh, something they're called um, um, two-and-a-half-dimensional face, which may seem a little bit odd, but we can use a 2D facial gallery, compare it to unposed, uncontrolled poses in the crowd. We do it for soccer hooligan detection in Europe. Um, we might as well do it at IED scenes, where we could capture passively images of the people around, associate them with the images captured at other scenes to be able to build a model of uh, who are we encountering on a frequent basis. But those might be examples of, uh, of biometrics, not civilian use, but where, where they might be used in, in the... And the, the last, uh, the, the facial recognition technology, uh, the two-dimensional uh, images, uh, how quickly does that happen? How, uh, you know, how rapidly can you find a, a cross-check? Oh, the, the, um, the, fa the matching algorithms um, are um, fast enough so that you could determine if somebody is in a known, say, watch list of um, magnitude equivalent to our national watch list in real time. Um, now, it depends to uh, encounter not on, on, it's not so much the elapsed time, it's the number of processors you have behind the scenes to be doing those checks in parallel against the known repository. Mm -hmm. So it may be that, that if we're talking about a tactical scene, yeah. that processing may be done by a server cluster, if you will, not on board, say, the mobile vehicle yeah. where the cameras and sensors reside, if that makes sense. Very good. Okay. Anybody else get a, to comment on biometrics? So. I would like to comment very briefly. I think when you use biometrics, you have to have a, a really a good domain awareness. What, what um, 
is the technical capability on the ground of that population. Um, so, and, and the reason for that is so you, you know what to use in terms of technology to get the kind of information that you need. Um, I, I think that's a, a, an, important, an important point here. Thank you. So, and for the panel, what, uh, what partner nation uh, training capabilities are particularly suited, in your views, uh, to be resident in DOD or in industry, particularly with regard to cybersecurity? Well, sir, I'm probably the closest person to a cybersecurity person here in the panel, so I'll thank you for the question because it's so important to our society and to our partner nations. Um, DOD through NSA and through the military network defense organizations that are companions with NSA is unrivaled in their, their ability to, to perform a mission under adverse and hostile network conditions. Um, having said that, um, we're challenged in theater because of the networks and the diversity of um, circumstances. And uh, um, I think that uh, we're facing a generational challenge to overcome this. Um, I appreciate the suggestion that we should have DOD training our, our, our allies. The truth is that we have too many cases that we know of of foreign intelligence services likely having penetrated systems that we depend upon for security because they're owned and operated by our friendly uh, 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 host governments and uh, they may have been designed or built in a way that didn't have first-rate security safeguards. Um, we, we, we've seen cases where a national identity system or border control system was having backup tapes of the encounter data sent unencrypted overseas to another country. So it could easily be penetrated and no one would have known. The tapes, in fact, could be altered. Um, I, I don't know if that's typical, uh, and that was some time ago, but uh, uh, there are a number of situations like that where basic uh, cyber hygiene and uh, um, practices that we think of as kind of uh, mid-level protection, not esoteric against high-level threats, just the basics, um, are, will not be found overseas, and it's very important that we share that knowledge. Yeah. Yeah, it's a disappointing, but uh, surprising. It's a good point to make. Thank you. Anyone on that point? No? Okay. Um, if I could then, just my final question to, uh, to Mr. Costa. Um, what do you see as the future of the department's human social, cultural, and behavioral, or SSCB uh, uh, modeling capability after the drawdown of forces in Afghanistan? Thank you for that question. Uh, I see them as, as broadly applicable to, to all the challenges that are facing, you know, the, the Department of Defense, the intelligence community, and perhaps even State Department. Um, how, do we, um, how do we have any sense of short-term instability? How do we predict the next Arab Spring? That, that would, that's a great goal. We can't predict the next Arab Spring, but how could we predict it? How, how could we get a sense of awareness of how opinion and behavior and sentiment around the world is changing so that um, leaders like you and decision makers can get a, a sense a priori of, of what might be changing? Um, how can we, um, how can we understand how our U.S. messages, whether those are words or deeds, are being received around the world. Um, how can we understand whether our, um, whether our stability actions in country X are having any effect or having our desired effect? I, I believe that the technologies associated with in this, what we call this human social culture behavior domain, have, have extremely broad applicability, and, and I've seen them applied to a variety of missions already countering WMD, countering proliferation, um, in addition to a regular warfare. So I, I see the future as quite bright for the applicability of these technologies. Very good. Thank you. With that, uh, I have no further questions. I'll, I'll yield back and again thank the Chairman for holding the hearing, but uh, also to our witnesses for your testimony today. Thank you for the work you're doing. Uh, thank, thank the gentleman. Um, Mr. Costa, is that sort of modeling more challenging in a tribal society or, or uh, sir, um, the, um, it, it's, it's always challenging. The modeling is always challenging. Uh, and frankly, the, the, uh, the more granular become, the, the smaller the group you're trying to model becomes, 
uh, in some senses it gets more challenging to do it to do it that way. Um, strategic modeling, while challenging, may be just modeling nation-state interaction. Yeah. Incredibly complex. Yeah. Yeah. But now when we want to go subnationally and model competing yeah. groups, we have to have far more data and model to more precision. And, and in some cases it can be done, but yet the reusability of that model becomes a question. So nation, nations don't change quite that rapidly, but groups um, can, and so that, that sort of modeling gets quite complex. So I think while this technology is very applicable to regular warfare, when we start to move upward toward subnational and national levels, it gets even more possible and, and um, even perhaps more effective. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, let me, if, if I could, kind of broaden back out to the general topic uh, that we are, are thinking about today, uh, irregular warfare. My view is that uh, we're going to have a lot more of this in various places all around the world. Uh, uh, I think that that's inevitable. Uh, and, and I take the point that uh, at least some elements of DOD and other agencies kind of want to turn the page and go back to regular warfare. Uh, they, you know, there, there's resistance to that. But, but I guess I'd be interested from each of you as to what sort of capabilities should we look for to, for DOD to retain in thinking about irregular warfare? What sorts of capabilities uh, does it make more sense for DOD to engage the private sector to obtain? And, 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 and talk about, at least based on your experience, that interaction of the DOD choosing to engage the private sector and how well or how poorly that, that works. So kind of, kind of a, a broader question, thinking about irregular warfare, what does DOD need to be able to do itself? What can it hire out? And that, that interaction between the two, uh, oversight, if you will, uh, procurement, this, that, where, where the two come together, uh, how's that going and how can it be made better? So. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, thank you very much uh, for your question. I, I guess I would start by saying in, in, in order to uh, employ proper IW technologies, I think it's, it's important to define where we want to go, what we want to do. And, and at, at times that is not very clear and therefore it's, it, it becomes difficult to figure out what type of technologies to use. So if we take issues like Libya or Syria today or Mali or wh whatever's going on, if it, f first and foremost we have to define what we want the warfighter to achieve at the end. And that's a political process, I think, that would just – so uh, at that in terms and, and I, of – I don't want to interrupt, but, yes, but so, so you got to know what your goal is before you can decide what the capability is that you need to have or to procure? Or to procure or invest in uh, in in a in a, in a that's shrinking. That's got to be country by or case by case. Well, and and, and so it it just depends on what 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 the long term goals and where our focus are where our focus is going to be for the up for the near future. Uh, I guess it it just boils down to having an end goal in order to employ. But because as I as I view it, if we're talking about a resource constrained environment and we have a shrinking budget. We have to be. Uh, we have to be. We have to use our resources in a, in a in a in an effective way, and therefore we have to pick what we actually invest in. Technology is great, but uh, I'm I'm a former aviator by trade, so we we, we invest in, in large ticket items that cost billions of dollars when we can employ um, uh, less amount of money in technologies that can give us more bang for the buck, depending upon where we're going. So. That would be one. I think uh, I mentioned it in my testimony when I talk about AFPAC hands. That's a great program that could be employed, for example, with with our uh, our regional centers in making our warfighters smarter on particular regional areas of the world with longevity. Meaning that you know when we cycle our soldiers out on the battlefield, typically they'll have two, three years in country and they push out, and then a new person has to relearn the new. But when we have longevity in a particular environment, we become smarter and therefore we know what technologies to employ based on that environment that we've been living in or operating in for long periods of time. I think that would, that would be the case that I would make. And so there's no, 
there's no silver bullet for any of our uh, of the, for this question for but you know the key is is defining truly where we want to go into the future and and I would leave it at that yeah uh, and, and I'll, I'll just comment I, th I think you're right resource constrained environment and yet we need to invest ahead of time in the people to have the cultural social language capabilities for those places and that's going to be hard in a resource environment I, I you know but 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 your point about the importance of that the irreplaceability of that when you get into a situation strikes a chord with me but but I think there is going to be that tension I think you're right about that y yes sir it's I mean it, obviously it's there's no again there's no perfect answer uh, this is this is an evolving the enemy's evolving all the time our, our issues are evolving all the time so I think I think when we go back to basics and this is probably the point that I'm trying to drive home um, in, in what I'm saying today is uh, the social cultural aspect I think in, in everything is, is 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 extremely important in order to drive where we resource our technologies to to be effective in particular problem sets around the world I in when when I understand the environment, say, for instance, in Lebanon and in Syria, and I've spent enough time studying it, I will know what technologies to employ in that particular environment to achieve the end results of what our political process is asking me to do. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I want to be careful how I respond to that. I'd like to start, if you don't mind, just by talking for one moment about what it is that I do for a living. My job is to look at commercial technologies and try to figure out where they're cost effective and applicable to our government's missions. And likewise, to look at the government developed technologies that we're familiar with to see where they're cost effective and of value in the private sector. Because for my company, three quarters of, or more of our customers are outside the US federal government. And that's how we bring value. So we spend a lot of time trying to look at technologies like what I mentioned in my uh, statement earlier uh, regarding personal authentication. Um, but I would suggest that perfect is the enemy of good. In austere budgets, we can't afford to have ambitious, unrealistic stretch objectives driving the way that we, we, we build systems and we specify them. I don't think we can afford to have shortfalls in capability where they're vital, but I think it's, it, it's a very difficult trade-off. And I think we can learn a bit from our commercial programs where there are capabilities that might be good enough and have defense-grade security capabilities built in even if they don't necessarily meet the full list of desired functionality. And that may be the best we can afford in some cases because the alternative may be providing no capability whatsoever. Um, and, and with respect to our current Defense Department and how it handles information technology, I think there's a lot of progress to look at commercial platforms to see how they can apply. The latest Army uh, um, uh, NIE, the, the integration evaluation, used a commercial smartphone uh, from Samsung as the uh, display unit for maps tied to the rifleman radio. That, I think, is an example of what we have no choice but to do because we can't afford to build ruggedized military-grade display devices that cost 10 times or 100 times as much. I think the same thing is going to be applied more and more across the spectrum. And my guess is that we'll end up with bigger bang for our buck, if you will, but we may also find cases where, where we have to still deal with specialized development of a custom solution because the military does have unique needs, and balancing that will become the issue. So, so you see the trend because, uh, because of tight budgets, among other reasons, to uh, using more commercially available technology and, and making it fit. Uh, I guess the good enough, particularly when we're, we're trying to build partnership capacity. Well, it, it's not, but, but, but sir, it's not just because of tight budgets, it's also because of the accelerated pace of change. If you stuck with custom platforms, like we used to build to put down the hatches of the nuclear submarines, you'd have computers like on the Apollo capsule. If you use commodity IT servers that are coming out that can be configured with virtualization in the cloud, they're so much cheaper, but they're less reliable. But if we cluster them together, they work fine. I think it's also the, the fact that we want to harness that innovation in the private sector, but we can't do it unless we accept the commercial platforms on Modify. Sir, I'll actually um, start by addressing the point that my colleague to the right just made. I believe that absolutely there's, there's much commercial technology that the Department of Defense and the federal government can leverage in the domain that I'm speaking to in this, 
in this human terrain domain. There's, there's much technology that can be leveraged and, and that is being done. However, there are certain things that aren't being done by commercial industry and that has to be done by DOD research. But yet, that DOD research needs to transition to the warfighter, to programs of record, and perhaps back to commercial industry because that way we both stimulate the economy and we get that technology into commercial solutions that are then available for the broader government to, to, bring, to bear on challenges. So I believe that it's both, that, that we have to leverage commercial technology, but yet the results of DOD research can in fact go back into that and stimulate the economy and bring value to the warfighter. But I believe that there are low cost technologies that allow us to understand violent extremists their networks, their groups, and the spread of their messages. And that's key to irregular warfare. And that um, people on this panel that conduct such analysis can use tools like this to, to achieve that understanding, at least at some level, while they conduct their deeper understanding. We also have some technologies that allow us to understand the effects of our messages. And they're still in their infancy. I'm not over-promising that any of these technologies are, are a magic uh, or silver bullet, but they allow us to understand some of the effects. And we're pushing beyond just correlation, we're, we're pushing toward causation. We said the following, and based on that, you know, this happened, and that was because of, because of our actions. We're pushing toward that, that, that is a, a promise, but not yet here. In addition, we have technologies that allow us to do course of action analysis. So if we do X, then Y, we expect the best result to happen. So that also has pertinence to irregular warfare. Um, so I think with that, there, there are clear things that DOD and the private sector can do. DOD has a clear mission to conduct this regular warfare. Um, contractors, uh, companies can help with that and engaging. However, in my domain, um, we can help deeply in helping technology and bringing that to bear on this mission. And, and how effective is DOD at figuring out what it needs to invest in itself versus uh, let the private sector do? Well, personally, I've, I've spent a lot of time with the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering staff on the Human Social Culture Behavior Program, and we monitor the commercial environment and work closely with them, so we never willingly knowingly um, built something that we could buy. We keep close track of where commercial industry is. So you think at least in that area, they're, they're, it's, it's working pretty well. Keep track of what the commercial sector is doing so you don't duplicate and, and, and then at the same time figure out the key areas where DOD dollars need to be invested. Absolutely. I believe that we've done a, a good job in this area and in fact in this area we have, um, we are transitioning some of these technologies to commercial companies to, to again, close that loop and, and make those more broadly available. So I do think this is a success story. I'm not sure that's the case in all areas, but I'm glad to hear success stories when I can find them. Sir. Mr. Jacobs. Thank you again. Contractors should not collect information. Contractors should not be tasking individuals to collect information. That is an inherently governmental function to collect human intelligence information. Contractors, on the other hand, can mentor, train, and advise very effectively. And through observations on the ground, one of the key capabilities of the contractor community is sustainment. The military has an, an unbelievable rotation cycle. The op tempo is, is just an incredible uh, difficult thing for our military commanders to to manage. They come to Afghanistan for a year and leave. Contractors, on the other hand, have been, uh, I mean, and from, from my experience, have been on the ground for years in Afghanistan doing the mentoring and training and developing those key relationships that are required to do this kind of work. So that's a differentiator between a contractor sustainment over a, a period of time versus the military. Um, the, other th the other item that I would like to, to point out too is that the Congress has invested heavily in the past 10 years since 9-11 in a lot of technologies. 
lots and lots of good things have come from that investment. But what my observations have been over time is that we, we don't institutionalize the success stories, the things that really work, the technologies that really work. And we need to have some resource, some font, where that is captured and not lost. And the, and the investment that has been made, hundreds and millions of dollars have not, will not be lost to the future battles that we will find ourselves in. We all agree that uh, there are many unsettled states out there and the technologies that we talk about here will be required. And we, we know from industry, really through independent assessments and some other tools that we've employed based upon Congress's tasking of those things, we know they work. So we need to capture those things. I don't want th that to be lost here today. Um, and um, Cap capture how? We need to capture it in doctrine, in strategy. We need to capture it in the schoolhouses by which we teach our leaders, in which we teach our train and, and equip our soldiers. We train and equip our State Department foreign, foreign uh, specialists, uh, our police advisors. We need to capture these lessons learned. We really do. And it needs to be written down or it will be lost. Franks. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank all of you for, for being here. I know you all contribute in many different ways, many times in your own specific esoteric way uh, to strengthen the, the national security of this nation, and I, and I truly appreciate it. I'm going to go ahead and, and just uh, do a shout out here. Uh, uh, former Congressman Saxton's here in the office, uh, the room here, too, and he's a, he's a, he was here when I came into Congress uh, 11 years ago, and that doesn't mean he's old. Uh, that, 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 this, that this means he was here, <laughs> but uh, always grateful to see him. Um, Mr. Jacobs, if I could, I'd like to, to direct my question to you, sir. Um, can you share some of the, the metrics that highlight the, the successful implementation of these human intel based programs? You know, I, I just think that uh, obviously all of us know that the, the real the, the best intelligence is uh, boots on the ground, human intelligence. And uh, I'd like to get sort of these, these metrics or the results of some of your human intelligence programs. I mean, how many lives do they think you, do you think you and your team have, have been able to actually save? And, uh, and has that been as a direct result of their sort of unique role in the, in the human terrain, uh, and I, I, I'll, I'll follow up if I need to, but it gives you sort of a flavor. Sure. Thank you for the question. There have been great capacity built uh, in the last four years on the part of um, the security forces in Afghanistan, both on the police side and on the army side. Um, the results of that mentoring and training um, has resulted in hundreds of insurgents being captured or killed. I think, you know, probably my last count, over 600 insurgents have been captured or killed. Um, the weapons of insurgency have been taken out of production in terms of kilograms of, of um, the, 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 the chemicals that are used to hurt and harm and kill our soldiers and Marines. Um, but the more tangential, the, the more direct is to um, see the incredible um, capacity that has been at, started years ago from, from a zero now probably to out of 10, a level five, a level six in terms of their ability to collect information, analyze that information, target and take down the bad guy. I was in Afghanistan again several weeks ago. There was attack at the airport. Uh, three years ago, that SWAT capability by the police would have taken days to resolve. <coughs> 
This was done in about four to five hours. They came, they, they, they identified, they secured the perimeter to protect the public and killed the, the bad guys. Pretty impressive, pretty impressive. That's progress. That really is ta tangential progress on the ground. Um, and so I don't want to get into a lot of the, the, the specifics, but one of the beauties, and I think every successful program needs to have an independent analysis by a third party to look at it and to kick the tires. It's very important. And um, the RAND Corporation has done that on our, on our legacy program, funded by the United States Congress, to look at whether or not this truly is a unique capability um, that we should have. And the studies have begun in 2008, and they go on to this day. Legacy is probably one of the most unique programs that have been countless studied by RAND. And without a doubt, they show clearly that these kinds of programs work and that we should have this capability in our arsenal, in our toolbox of a regular warfare. The other thing that the RAND Corporation has talked about um, is um, the, the measures of effectiveness that we go into and we measure, we have 500 data points and I'm not going to get into all the details of that, but those data points um, measure, are quantifiable and measurable to the outcomes of the program. And it ensures that the taxpayers are getting their money's worth, that this program actually works and that's why we, we do what we do. So I know I've been rambling a little but, bit and have covered a lot of things, but. Mr. Chairman, if you afford me just one last follow-up here, because I've been listening very carefully to what you're saying, and I'm wondering if you might have, because I know it's impossible to get into some of the minutia, but if you might have some sort of compilation of, of some of the things that we're talking about here today, and as you know, especially as a, that you could give to us that would have an impact not only to the members of this committee, but to the, to the larger membership of the Armed Services Committee. Um, and as we move forward, it seems especially important with this transition period in Afghanistan where combat operations will you know, some, some soon draw to a close, uh, would you say programs like this will increase or decrease in importance? And uh, what are some of the hardware tools that best suit operators who are, lying, are trying to, to build intelligence capacity in this environment? Uh, you know, it especially seems like a, a relevant question given the, some of the majority of our Afghan partners are still using technology like flip cell phones. That's uh, right. So uh, that's right. And I'd love to get some sort of written overview of this because, you know, this is, if this is saving lives, and you're saying your testimony is that this is saving it lives. Is saving here, lives, yes. Uh, American yes. Uh, and coalition lives. Yes. Uh, one thing I would, would caution, um, a lot of things get caught up in drawdowns, you know, and we need to be very careful not to cut the ability to build capacity by our allies. And my concern is that in the rush, um, we, 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 we don't leave a true capacity on the part of our Afghan partners to penetrate networks. And that needs to be sustained, mentored, and continue to be nurtured on the part of the United States of America. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Otello, we've got security challenges all across Africa. Would you, would you foresee that it would make sense for the government to hire companies to help build capacity, build, uh, improve security forces in some of the various countries you're familiar with? Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for your question. Um, certainly, companies can can uh, can provide uh, uh, capabilities. Abs absolutely, uh, I, I think uh, these companies need to be carefully selected. Uh, I think we need to also carefully select what we employ because, as as we make certain countries uh, more capable, we also at the same time the enemy becomes more capable in time adjusting to you know what 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 the realities are on the ground and so we gotta we gotta define that and figure out what we're trying to achieve again going back to my 
uh, earlier statement is what is our end game? Once we define that, uh, we, we can obviously employ, there are places across the Sahel, of course, in, in Somalia. Uh, now we're looking at tensions between, uh, you know, the two Sudans and uh, in Egypt and, and Ethiopia. These are going to continue to fester. And there are certainly places with our small companies um, like we see here or mine where we can bring in some of that. Um, we can bridge the gap between uh, usage of proper well-fitted technologies and into specific cultures to achieve the end means that we're aiming for. And, um, and I, I, I always go back to the problem is, is not what we're capable. We can do a lot of stuff. The, the thing is, is are we doing the right things? That's, that's, that's the question, is, is what, what, what does right look like at the end? And, and um, I think that's, that's, that's important to actually answer. Great. Well, uh, thank you all. I appreciate it. Uh, I think this is going to be a topic that occupies us a lot in the years to come, and, and each of you uh, have, have helped enlighten me, at least, on, on how to move forward. So again, thank you for being here. Thank you for your testimony, and thank you for your patience on our interruption. With that, the uh, hearing stands adjourned.